welcome everyone to the Planning Commission meeting for July 28th. Um, Wayne or whomever, Ms. Michaela or Norton Nick, would you care to give a, um, a brief introduction on how people can participate? Uh, yeah, I can do that. Thank um, you. <clears throat> I'm going to share my screen here really fast. And hopefully this will show up here in just a moment. Can you all see my screen? No, I cannot. Okay, let's give it a minute here. Now I can. Okay. So for those of you that are joining us, um, welcome. Uh, on the screen, you'll see um, a couple of links. Uh, one is the actual link to the meeting. Um, and then there's a, uh, a a link to a guide to help you uh, be involved and and some instructions on how to how to be involved into the meeting. For those of you that would like to speak, it's really it'd be a good idea to write down that email address that's listed here. It's planning dot comments at slcgov.com. Um, we have people that are monitoring our email system. So if you're having difficulty uh, wanting to make a comment or get in, you can send those uh, send us an email and we can read your um, comments during the hearing. Um, for those of you that are in attendance, uh, if you open up your, I believe it's your participants panel or your attendee panel, there's a, a very small little hand looking thing down here when the item comes up the public hearing for the item that you'd like to speak if you could hit that hand button that lets us know that um that you'd like to speak on that item um and that's all i have okay thanks wayne uh two, 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 two. it looks like we have carolyn now and we're just missing crystal so if she pops on then i'll try to pay attention to that um we do not have minutes um prepared for last meeting so we will not be voting on that um brenda is absent today so we don't have a any remarks from the chair i have none as vice chair um but the director i believe has um some comments they'd like to share uh to the commission I guess I, I okay can, thanks I was like I hope I was right I I can start I don't know if there's a specific things you wanted me to share but um one thing that is just just happened in the city is that the mayor has issued a new executive order due to the increase in uh COVID cases um and so we don't know what that means for the hybrid meetings that we've been planning on hosting that we keep getting delayed but just want to let the planning commission know that um, there's a good chance that we're going to be staying um, virtual uh, for the foreseeable at least in the short term but we'll know more uh, after we work with a uh, city recorder and the city council on what they're doing and, and hopefully follow those leads so just wanted to give a heads up about that um, since you met last the city council has um, heard a num a number of gave several briefings on various proposals that have come through the planning commission uh, they held a briefing on the changes to the special exceptions um, and eliminating those uh, two weeks ago and that's scheduled for a, a public hearing and tentative date for a decision in august so We'll keep you up to date on how that unfolds. Um, they also approved a number of um, zoning changes, including the zoning change along uh, at the old Snellgrove site in Sugar House. So that project will be, uh, it's still in that plan development design review phase, I think, one of those two applications. Um, but I'm not quite sure what the status of that is. So anyway, I just wanted to give you a quick um, update on that. And um, I think we gave you an update on this in July, but for those that may have missed it, um, in the in the budget that was adopted in June for this current fiscal year, the city council did allocate four new positions in planning. So 
um, we're going to be that money becomes available on September 1. And so we're going to be reorganizing our division a little bit so we can have more focus on um, big picture policy types of things. And so um, that's that's a good thing. So hopefully uh, we can address some of these issues that the community, the, the city, the, the planning commission has, have identified as, as things that need to be uh, either um, address because it's the right thing to do or there are problems with the code or there's ways to improve the code. So uh, hopefully it'll probably take us a few months to get new people up to speed and on board. But um, when we, once we do, hopefully we start seeing some of those types of um, general improvements to our, our plans and, and codes. So that's all I have. Oh, and one other thing you should know that the, um, the design review decision for the Utah theater site was appealed so that um, that was anticipated so we will be um, working through that process as well okay thank you nick uh i i failed to download that kind of agenda that has all the steps to it but i think i got them all but let me know if i missed something if we're ready to start um the public hearings um we can begin with number one, which is the Ivory House, University Ivory House Zoning Map Amendment. Let me open it, sorry. <clears throat> Did we approve okay. the minutes? Um, we do not have any minutes available. Uh, they were not completed uh, for um, the last meeting, so we'll have uh, two minutes to approve next time. Okay, so moving on to public hearing agenda item number one, this is the zoning map amendment plan development and design review PLN PCM 2021-00313 PLN PCM 2021-00314 and PLN PCM 2021-00315 and I believe the planner is Kelsey. Yes, thank you. Good evening commission. Uh, this is a project um, represented for the Clark and Christine Ivory Foundation, and they are requesting approval to construct a multiple building student housing development located at 1780 East South Campus Drive, as indicated on the aerial. The development consists of four buildings, three of which have public street frontage on Mario Capecchi and South Campus Drive. Um, they are proposing to construct 536 student housing units, um, ranging in each building. As part of the proposal, the applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment from I, the Institutional Zoning District, to the RMU, which is a residential mixed use. Additionally, a plan development and design review approval are required for the proposed development. Um, I will start re with the review of the zoning map amendment. So the amendment for the subject property is uh, from I, which is institutional to RMU, which is a residential mixed use. The property was recently subdivided from the larger 30.8 acre site to create approximately 5.4 acres, um, which is a new corner parcel, which has frontage both on Mario Capecchi Drive and South Campus Drive. The existing property currently contains a Church of the Latter-day Saints uh, Institute building, uh, which was used associated with the University of Utah. And the existing zoning is institutional, which you can see is also the zoning to the north, the east, and the west, as well as the south. Additional zones in this area include Research Park and some open space zoning. The uses which abut this property include a uh, parking garage associated with the LDS church and additional campus land uses, some um, student housing, as well as uh, Fort Douglas to the east. Generally, the land uses in the specific area uh, are all associated with the campus and the University of Utah. 
The following couple slides are photos of the property. Uh, you have a photo of the property looking west. Sorry, these aren't the best photos. It's actually a challenging property to photograph. Um, and then a, prop, a photo of the subject property looking southwest. Uh, again, southwest and then directly west. And these are two photos of the abutting, well, adjacent and abutting. So the other corner property to the north is the lower photo and to the east is Fort Douglas. The RMU zoning district <clears throat> differs from the institutional zoning district in regard to the development scale. Uh, comparing the three development standards, the three key development standards, by right building height and setbacks in the RMU does allow for larger scaled buildings than in comparison to the I. Additionally, the RMU permits substantially smaller setbacks um, and also a variety of new uses than the institutional zoning district. <clears throat> and that includes multifamily zone or multifamily uses. The permitted and conditional uses are addressed on page five of the staff report. The requested zoning map amendment um, is supported by the East Bench Master Plan policy statements and guidelines for regional activity centers. The rezone locates a large student housing project within the University of Utah boundaries and relieves some traffic pressure for student commuters along Foothill Drive. The location, according to the East Bench Master Plan policies, is preferred due to its proximity to the U. And the proposed rezone would encourage a student housing development where student housing is needed, which is on campus. Um, additionally, this development would relieve some pressure in the East Bench neighborhoods, which currently serves as um, where many of the students live currently. There were no identified conflicts or concerns with the policy statements or guidelines within the East Bench Master Plan. Um, additionally, the Plan Salt Lake um, had four identified guiding principles in support of the proposed rezone. In consideration with the discussed zoning map amendment, the applicant is also requesting approval for an associated plan development and design review. The plan development is, a, is to accommodate multiple buildings on one lot, which of what, one of which does not have public street frontage. And the design review is required to exceed the maximum front yard setback within the RMU zoning district. That requirement specifies that 25% of the building frontage is required to be within 15 feet of the front line, uh, front property line. And the development incorporates large front yard setbacks along the street frontages. Uh, the, these setbacks range from approximately 26 feet to 41 feet, and that's to preserve the existing mature landscape, landscaping along uh, Mario Capecchi and South Campus Drive. The design of the buildings is fairly traditional. The primary elevations of each building consists of high percentage of glass and durable materials. The durable materials consist of brick veneer, uh, hardy board siding, and accents of metal roofing. The following slides identify where the buildings are located, the associated height, and the materials. So building A faces South Campus Drive, it's approximately 67 feet and 11 inches in height. This is the associated primary elevation as well as the plan view. Building B faces Mario Capecchi, approximately 73 feet in height. Uh, primary elevation facing Mario Capecchi as well as the plan view. Building C is uh, 66 feet, uh, seven inches. The primary elevation as well as the plan view. And then building D, which also faces Mario Capecchi is approximately 73 feet, uh, three inches in height. And this is the primary elevation and the plan view. They're all uh, designed quite similarly. In regard to the landscaping and the parking circulation, the red boxes identified along South Campus Drive and Mario Capecchi highlight the mature landscaping that the developer is hoping to preserve 
through the design review process. And then the red arrows indicate the parking access, which is actually off of Research Road, which is a private street um, owned by the University of Houston. I, I will also note that the parking is um, primarily behind building D and B. The two identified considerations addressed within the staff report are a building without public street frontage and the increased front yard setback for the RMU zoning. And in summary, uh, staff is recommending that the Planning Commission forward a positive recommendation to the City Council for the requested map amendment and approve the requested plan development and design review with the listed conditions. And at this point, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Um, do any commissioners have any questions for staff at this time? Kelsey, I have a question. Is are there plans like is there is this area part of like the university's campus master plan? Are there any university specific plans related to this area? I believe that the university was working on a plan. And I'm not familiar with its publication. Um, there are two representatives from the university here this evening to speak on behalf of this project, and they should be able to address that okay. question. Okay, I'll wait to hear from them. Thanks. Of course. Any other commissioners? All right. Kelsey, I have a question about landscaping. Um, are there any provisions in this zoning to uh, increase some of the landscaping in the interior of this development because it doesn't look like there's anything there's actually quite a bit of landscaping let me pull up my presentation again so they create a quad um with locating the buildings near the street frontage right here so this area is meant to serve as a gathering space for the students living in these buildings. And it will be a combination of landscaping and some hardscaping to serve for those activities. So this landscaping will be preserved as is, and then they'll be adding these open space areas. So I believe the ratio of landscaping of open space to building. Let me just pull up my plan. It's fairly high. Bear with me for just a moment. It's fine. Thank you. No, you're fine. I'm working on a loaner computer, so just <laughs> patience. I apologize. It's One not moment. a problem. Okay. So the landscaping is, uh, there's 20% required in the RMU and they're providing 28.5%, which is totaling 67,000 square feet approximately. Okay, thank you, Kelsey. Um, any other commissioners have questions for staff? Okay, so the two presenters that I had listed for tonight are not in the list. so. Uh, you might need to tell me who is presenting for the applicant. Because I had yeah, Ashley uh, Hadfield and Scott Bates. Ashley Hadfield is in the list. Oh, we're okay. Both we're, we're both together tonight. Oh, you already have you moved them to the present panelist? Yeah, they're in the panelist list right now. I'm gonna make I was them. looking at I was looking in the attendees, so that's why I didn't see them. So good. Okay. We will move on to the um, presenters. So we have Ashley Hadfield and Scott Bates who are together um, to present for the applicant. Um, Ms. Hadfield and Mr. Bates, you have 10 minutes 
um, to give your presentation. And if you are ready, uh, they can give you presenter rights if you have a presentation to um, take over the screen. But the sure. time is yours. Thank you. We're ready. Go ahead. Thank you. I'll start out. Um, my name's Scott Bates. I'm very excited to represent this amazing project. It brings Salt Lake City, the University of Utah, the LDS Church, and the Ivory Foundation together as partners to meet the critical needs of student housing near campus. And also, it creates an innovative model to fund scholarships for tens of thousands of students over the next century. Um, I'm also excited because I'm a U of U grad, undergrad, and also a law school grad, and I've been involved in real estate law and development for 23 years and done a lot of neat projects that have been cool to be involved with, such as overseeing the renovation of the Utah Jazz Arena. But this one has been the most gratifying project because of the social impact that it'll have. Um, allow me a minute to introduce the uh, Ivory Foundation to you. Its core mission is focused on two areas of social need. That is funding scholarships for students who are most in need and providing housing solutions where critical shortages and affordability are at issue. Um, the goal of the mission is to move from helping hundreds of students with scholarships to tens of thousands of students uh, to attend the U of U who otherwise wouldn't be able to do so. This project will help achieve that goal. As I mentioned, we're here representing the Ivory Foundation and its trustees' message is that they believe in investing to change lives. This project is really about impacting students' lives through innovative partners, investing in their future. University House, as mentioned by Kelsey, will provide 536 single student rooms. It is an attractive and traditional design. It will create an academically focused collaborative and safe living and learning environment for students who call it home. This project is only made possible by a collaboration with valued partners who together will help the University of Utah educate students, making a huge social impact for good. I'd like to thank the University of Utah who's helped with approvals and administrative support and ongoing support with scholarship funding. I'd like to thank Salt Lake City in particular the community development team and planning staff have been remarkable to work with during this entitlement process so far, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which has agreed to demolish an existing functioning chapel and give Ivory Foundation a hundred-year lease on the ground to enable this project to help students. Some of our other partner support statements are very appreciated. So what will Ivory House do? It will first, it will make cri two critical needs. First, it will help meet the need, the critical student housing need near campus. The data for this slide was provided by our partners, the University of Utah, who are here tonight in support of the project. In addition, the planning staff report notes that in 2014, there were 32,000 students enrolled at the U of U, but only 3,300 student housing units on or near campus. The next critical need that this project will fulfill is providing scholarships for those who need them most. Since 2003, the Ivory Foundation has provided over 5,000 scholarships and internships to students. Their, their focus is on students who, again, need it the most. First-generation students who, whose parents and grandparents, et cetera, have never attended college. And then Ivory Accelerated Scholarships are focused on those students who are enrolled but have to drop out due to financial hardship. We approach those students, provide them a scholarship, so that they can come back and finish their degree. This project really will increase the ability for the Ivory Foundation to provide tens of thousands of scholarships, and it will do it, it will do it um, as the next slide shows. What will happen is an innovative model will be created where the, the rents, the re rental revenue generated by University of House will fund a scholarship fund and then be distributed to those who need it most. This will become a perpetual cycle for funding scholarships. The Ivory family wants every dollar generated by Ivory University House to fund scholarships in this manner for the next century. So I think you can see why now why I'm so excited because it is rare that public and private partners can come together to impact not only students living in the University of House, but also future students, tens of thousands at the University of Utah who otherwise wouldn't be able to attend. 
I'd invite questions from any members of the commission so far. Uh, yeah, you just keep with your uh, presentation and we'll take questions when you're done. You okay, have great. About five minutes left. Thank you. So I'll turn the rest of our presentation over to Ashley Hadfield, who's the lead project manager for this and is overseeing the design, development, and construction of Ivory House. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Um, planning commissioners, it's great to be before you this evening. Um, First thing that you need to know about me, I'm also a proud um, University of Utah alumni, even though my family are BYU fans, so it causes a little bit of strife, but um, I graduated from the Master's of Real Estate Development program back in 2019, and upon graduation, I came and started working at the Ivory, um, the Ivory Foundation, and um, the Ivory Foundation's been a lot of fun, and there's always exciting projects going on, and this is um, one of them that I've really been happy to be involved with. Um, the best part about working for the Ivory Foundation is that we get to work with a lot of people who are doing really good. And a unique thing about this project is we've been able to bring in recently graduated students as long as current students and been able to get their um, feedback in this project. And it's been fun to have their um, energy and also um, their input as we've been designing this. So to get started, let's kind of talk about the site. There could not be a better site for this project. And we are very grateful for the church to being able to work with us on it. Um, the site has 5.4 acres. It's Kitty Corner, Mario Capecchi, and South Campus Drive. There's a lot of great benefits. We're close to the U. There's a track station. The Students Life Center is a five-minute walk away. But there's also a lot of benefits here for the Salt Lake City residents. And um, some of those are that we are able to reduce the traffic from daily student commuters by bringing these students closer to campus and then also increasing this housing stock. As Scott mentioned, there isn't a lot of on-campus housing compared, comparatively to the student body here at BU. So um, as we set out to start looking at Ivory University House, we took a look at two main things. And that was, one, we wanted to make sure that we enhanced the surrounding um, development and the existing development there. And then two, we went out across the nation and went and looked for the best student housing and wanted to bring that back to Utah. And so that's what's really came up with this layout. So if you see the layout, we have 536 beds. Um, they're separated in between four buildings. And the reason why we did this is that as we were looking at these student housing complexes, there was great benefit for students to be able to get outside and get fresh air in a secure environment. And so this allows us to create two courtyards that have um, big gathering options while also having more intimate settings. So if we look at the elevations, this is color running, rendering of one of the buildings. Um, they'll kind of vary depending on the other three buildings, but the main thing I want to call to the attention is the masonry. Um, and this just kind of goes back to tying into the Institute in Fort Douglas. So as we were studying and doing our analysis nationally, there's two main things that we took away. And one is the need for good student engagement while also having some single living advantages. And so we've kind of came up with this new model that we're excited to introduce. And so you can see here that there is um, two, these red boxes, and these are our common cores. And as we've been doing our research, no student will tell you what a good common amenity space would be, because some of them want gaming areas while some want study halls. So we're able to have the flexibility of being able to offer this in a variety of ways. And there's some inspiration photos of what we've been looking at. The next thing is um, the actual student units. And these are what we are really excited about. So as you can see here, this is an example of one of our units. Um, you can see that each student will have their own bathroom and their own bedroom space, but they'll also have the option of having a kitchen or kitchenette. Um, on the left, you can see some inspiration photos of what these kind of look like. And why um, we kind of moved to this is that I think we can all talk about from our um, college days of having student roommate drama. And um, this allows these students to create their own healthy environment in which they can kind of control what comes in, in and out while being able to go out into the hallways and the common areas and get, being able to have that face-to-face -face, um, engagement. Um, this also allows students to focus on studies. And then another major thing that we've been focusing on is the safety of students. And so our building has a three-point check entrance. So this allows us to make sure that people are getting in who needs to be in and keeping people out who aren't supposed to be there. We're also gonna have on-site security here, um, which we are very um, excited about. And then also, again, we're just kind of making sure that we create the most healthy and engaging environment for these students as they continue their education career. So with that, um, we are very excited to be here tonight as you are our next step in fulfilling our mission of creating opportunities for affordable education and housing. 
um, we are requesting um, three things. One is the rezone from institutional to residential mixed use. And this just allows us to um, actually build this project. The second thing is, is that we are requesting the design review to save those 27 beautiful trees along Mario Capecchi and South Campus Drive. Um, and then the third thing is, is that we want um, the design, the plan development, which allows us to um, have the building in the back to be able to create that outdoor courtyard and keep those students and give them the opportunity to um, be able to be outside. So with that, we thank you so much for your time and we look forward to working with you as we create a opportunity for students to be able to um, be able to succeed in their higher education and career. So thank you so much. And if any questions, I'm we'd happy, happy to answer. Great, thank you. Um, commissioners, any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, I actually have a question. Um, I didn't see any renderings in here to give me a good idea of um, regarding the plan development request for the one building that doesn't have street frontage is I can't in the staff report it's the typology is really fuzzy so I can't tell us that building C that is adjacent um, to the parking yes do you oh, have a, do you have a rendering that is from South Campus Drive to um, get a better look at how that lays out in regards to that building, since that's the one that is not facing the street? You know, I don't, we don't have one at this current time, but we'd be happy to um, be able to help provide any other information that you need. So yeah. how are people accessing that just through the parking lot? Um, yeah, parking lot right here. We also have entrances off this common courtyard and this connects to walkways that go out to this main street too. Okay, is there a walkway on the east side of building A, the one that, that fronts South Campus? Is there is that a walkway as well? Yes, yeah. uh-huh. So there's okay. a walkway here. This comes around and it comes back down and into the building, into this back building too. Okay, and on your landscaping, I'm assuming this um, is also part of the landscaping plan. What are your yellow, what are those yellow dots? So the yellow dots are the existing trees that we're wanting to preserve. And then the green ones are proposed new trees that we're looking to add to the site. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from commissioners before I open the public hearing? Commissioner uh, Becky. Sorry, oh, I'll yes. just, real quick. I do have an elevation of building C in my presentation, if you'd like me to share that again. Yeah, my, my thing got really fuzzy and I couldn't really see a lot of the Elevations well. Okay, let me see. I just I just made you presenter, so give it Thank a second. You. To be able to... Okay. I think I really was 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 looking to understand how that was functioning in relationship to the rest. So the walkways is very helpful, since that's the one building we're actually discussing in the plan development. That's correct. Um, can you see my site plan? I can. I couldn't okay. read the site plan in my my Dropbox. The wording was illegible. So, yeah, it does get yeah. a little fuzzy. Um, I'll just let it load a little bit, but that's much better. Yeah. So there are cooperate. Okay, there we go. So there's a walkway from South Campus. These walkways do connect. Um, from the existing sidewalk along South Campus all the way through this new kind of quad area to the eastern portion of this building. And then there's also an entrance. So here's the entrance from the eastern portion. So you could take tracks and still access this building from that track station, um, either this way, which is a semicircle, or around building A. Or if you have a single passenger vehicle and you park, there's an access from the parking lot as well. And then with the elevations, each elevation has large entrances for this building. So let me just share that one more time. Here we go. So there, um, 
they're the same on both sides. So this elevation would face, it's just behind that first building that faces South Campus Drive. This would be the elevation that you would see and students could enter from that track station or from campus. And then it would just be reversed um, as it faces the service parking lot. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you. Okay. You're welcome. All right. Last call for questions to the applicant from commissioners. Okay. One question, Amy, for the yes. applicant. Please. So, go ahead. I mean, I understand that the university supports, you know, more housing closer to campus. Um, but is, is there a campus wide master plan that sort of identifies areas in addition to this or possible housing development? I'm just curious more than anything if there's any other land use support for the rezone application. I think we'd better defer to um, the University of Utah representatives who are here tonight in support. They may know the answer to that question. We okay. don't we don't know it. I'm sorry. No, thank you. Hello, I'm Lori McDonald from the University of Utah. Oh, Ms. McDonald, we will pick you up in the public hearing portion, but if you would um, have an answer for that, that would be great. For that so, period? Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. just hold, hold, hold that thought for just a couple more minutes. But we do you. want to hear from you. Okay, we just have to do it in the right order so that we <laughs> um, run the meeting fairly. Understood. Um, Okay, with that, I am going to open the public hearing. I would um, just give you some brief uh, guidelines for the public hearing. If you wish to speak on this particular item, there is a little hand um, down at the bottom of your screen. It looks just like that. Go ahead and raise that. That lets us know that you wish to speak on this item when you have spoken. Um, please unclick that so we know you're done. You um, will have two minutes to speak and you can say whatever you wish, but if you're a University of Utah representative, um, please consider uh, addressing some of those master plan questions that Commissioner Bell brought up. That would be very helpful. Okay, uh, Wayne, do you see anyone from the Community Council? Um, I do not. There's actually not a community council for the University of Utah area. Uh -huh. Okay, then. Uh -huh. Well, then I, I, I'm going to uh, make the chair decision that normally we give community council representatives five minutes. I'm going to make the decision that the University of Utah representative can take that five minutes. Um, I've also moved over um, Jonathan Bates um, in case he wants to speak on behalf of the university into the panelists. So, Jonathan, you also can mute and unmute yourself. So, I'm going to give the University of Utah five minutes to speak. If uh, then after that five minutes, someone from the University of Utah wishes to speak again, you'll you'll end up with two minutes as um, a regular um, public participant. So, we would have. I think it was. Uh, I can't remember the first name, Laura McDonald, um, and then Bates was the one you just said. Yeah, Laura McDonald. Yes, and I. If can... you want to speak, um, go ahead. I'm going to give you guys the five minutes we normally would do at community council since there's not one in your area, and the time is yours. I will go ahead and have Jonathan speak to the master plan as he can be a little more detailed than I can. Thanks, Lori. I do just want to acknowledge that I'm joining the meeting more as a citizen than a university representative. But to answer the question about the master plan in my role at the university, the identified land is not university owned. It's owned by the LDS Church. And as such, it's not identified or a component of our master plan. We do have areas in our master plan identifying areas for additional student housing development for on campus housing. And this is I'm Lori McDonald. I'm the vice president for student affairs. I can just speak to the fact that we are seeing a, a tremendous increase in demand for student housing. We have more students coming to the university and applying and we this year we opened um, a 900 bed 
residence hall and it's completely full and we have a wait list. This year we experienced a wait list of over a thousand, which we have not had before. So we do know demand is growing and welcome opportunities for students to be close to campus um, in addition to our plans for expanding housing. Okay, thank you both um, for that. And uh, I appreciate uh, your participation tonight. So thank you. Uh, Wayne, is there any other hands up? You know, I do not see any other hands raised. Do I? Okay, and there are no um, emailed comments? No email comments. Okay, with that, I will close the public hearing. Um, bring it back to the planning commission for any final uh, questions or thoughts and comments at this time regarding the three questions before us, the zoning map amendment, um, the plan development and the design review and you, for applicants and staff. Nothing, well then I will entertain a motion at any time then. I'm willing to make a motion. Please, Andreas, wait, go ahead. One second, really quick, oh. Madam Chair. I, I apologize. I had moved Jonathan Bates over to the participant panel. His hand is raised. I don't know if he wanted to speak as a, a, yeah, a, I, a citizen. If, if you don't mind, I do have one comment and one question. My comment okay. is and both of these are as a citizen of an East Bench neighborhood. Um, first of all, I do want to acknowledge that I'm very supportive of this plan. My concern is around the density. On the East Bench, we have very few TOD potential opportunities. This is a prime location for TOD development, in my opinion, with its adjacency to tracks. While the applicant has uh, shown a density that meets current projections on demand for student housing, I am concerned about the density taking up 5.9 acres or close to six acres of TOD prime land without even meeting the current height limitations or, or seeking approval for additional height. Uh, I do suggest as a citizen in, on the East Bench that we take advantage of any TOD opportunities. We have very few, if any, multifamily projects focused on affordability in the East Bench. Uh, and I think this uh, current location is prime for density in a location that would not uh, create issues for single family neighborhoods. Uh, or other constituents. Those are my comments. And if you can get a question out of there, you're probably a better person than me, but hopefully there's a question in there as well. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bates. Okay, with that, I'll formally close the public hearing again um, and bring it back to the commissioners. And at this point, the applicant, if you would like to address Mr. Bates, um, the vision of having more density um, and more height, why you chose, uh, to do what you're presenting, that would be helpful. And that would be the applicant responding. Okay. Yeah, right now, um, based on current needs, this is kind of where we're projecting. We do have the option in the parking area to be able to go denser if we want. So we do have that option, um, depending on parking needs of the students. But right now, that's where we're kind of fitting up where we're seeing that need being. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Hadfield. Any other questions or comments and thoughts from the commissioners? If not, um, I think Andreas was ready to make a motion. I entertain that, Andreas. Sure, thank you. Um, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment file number PLN PCM 2021-00313, uh, PLN PCM 2021-00314, plan development, and PLN PCM 2021-00315, design review. For the property located at 1780 East South Campus Drive, 
Proposed zone change from one from I institutional to RMU residential mixed use zoning district. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, Carolyn, thank you. I have a motion from Andreas, a second from Carolyn. We will go ahead and take our vote. Uh, Sarah. Commissioner Barry, I'm so sorry to interrupt again. Um, the there is a condition in that motion that needs to be there. It's a condition that the city council approve the rezone, the plan development, and the design review are contingent upon that approval. That I'm opening yeah. up the motion sheet now. I'm uh, also not entirely sure we can do this as one motion since it's we're recommending you're right. the city council. Yeah, you're right. I had not opened the uh, motion sheet. Yeah. So Andreas, if we back out, it looks like we have a different um, motion for each uh, petition number. Not so sure. we can take these uh, one at a time uh, through the vote, and then we'll go back and do the second one and then the third. Okay. I'll do it here. based on the findings and analysis in the staff report testimony and discussion of the public hearing i move that the planning commission recommend that the city council approve the proposed zoning map amendment file number pln pcm 2021-00313 for the property located at 1780 east south campus drive proposed zone change from institutional to RMU residential mixed use zoning district. Thank you. So we have um, a motion for the um, zoning map amendment. Do I have a second for that one? I'll second again. Okay, Carolyn, thank you. All right, so we um, are voting specifically on the um, zoning map amendment at this time. And so I'll take a roll call. Sarah? Yes. Okay. Adrian. Yes, but I would also um, strongly encourage the university to consider the comments that were raised at the public hearing. And this is kind of the issue I was trying to get at of thinking more broadly about housing on campus and ways where that's appropriate, not necessarily on the university's property, but within the vicinity. But I still vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Maureen. Yes. yes. Thank you. John. Yes. Okay, Carolyn? Agree. Andreas? I'll vote yes. Okay. Um, with that, we have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six votes yes, zero no. So that passes. Um, I will now entertain a motion for the plan development uh, petition number. I can do that one as well, Madam Chair. Thank you. Go ahead. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment. File number PLN PCM 2021-00314, plan development for the property located at 1780 East South Campus Drive, proposed zone change from institutional to RMU zoning district. He he mixed up two motions there. Oh, yeah. did I? Yeah. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right. So let me, uh, the file number. Um, yeah, I'll do it again. Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony, and discussion of the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission recommend that the City Council approve the proposed zoning map amendment, file number PLN PCM 2021-00314. Plan development. Hey, Andre, you're still at the... You're on the you, wrong one. Yeah. Yeah. If you go down further in the document, um, under motion sheet for University Ivory House plan development. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay. Yeah, there that's you go. the one. Thank you, thank you. Okay, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the requested plan development, file number PLNPCM 2021-00314, for the 
for a principal building without street frontage located at approximately 1780 East South Campus Drive with condition one that the city council approve the requested zoning map amendment from institutional to RMU residential mixed use. Perfect, thank you. Can I you. second? I'll second. Who is that? Maureen. Maureen, okay, thanks, sorry, Maureen. Okay, I have a motion on the plan development portion from Andreas, a second from Maureen. Let's take our vote. Adrian. Yes. yes. All right, John. Yes. All right, Andreas. Hello, yes. Carolyn. Yes. Agree. Okay. Thank you. Maureen? Yes. And Sarah? Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, I will now entertain our final motion on this regarding, let me find it, the uh, design review, which is located on page four of the motion sheet down towards the bottom. I have the right one now, so I can do this okay. one as well. All right, you're on a roll, Andreas. Let's do it. Yeah, I guess so. All right, based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, testimony and discussion at the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve the requested design review, file number PLNPCM 2021-00315, for an increased front yard setback for the property located at approximately 1780 East South Campus Drive with the following condition. The applicant, number two, the applicant continues to work with urban forestry to ensure the appropriate tree preservation measures are taken along Mario Capecchi Drive and South Campus Drive. Number three, that the city council approve the requested zoning map amendment from I institutional to RMU residential mixed use. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. I have a motion on the design review portion from Andreas, a second from Carolyn. Let's take our vote. Maureen. Yes. yes. Sarah. Yes. Andreas. I vote yes. Adrian. Yes. Carolyn. Agree. Great, right, and John. Yes. Okay, that passes unanimously. Um, good luck, Ivory. You're, you've got our approval and good luck with the city council. We will move on to the next uh, agenda item, which is the plan development and preliminary subdivision for PLN SUV 2021-00242 and PLN PCM 2021-00242. 00248 Azure Place Plan Development and Preliminary Subdivision. And the planner is Katya. Thank you. I will start by loading up my presentation. Okay, so this presentation is for a plan development and preliminary subdivision for the Azure Place, um, which is located between uh, 600 North and 700 North and 300 West and Pugsley Street. This is the location of the proposed plan development and subdivision. Uh, this uh, is com comprised of four parcels and the applicant is um, proposing to consolidate the four parcels and subdivide the property to create 37 
residential three-story townhomes on approximately 0.96 acre and um, along with the preliminary subdivision. The, this slide shows uh, that the Capitol Hill master plan calls for this site to be high density. And um, the other slide also shows the um, zoning on, on the site, which is mixed use and, uh, you know, around that area also. These are photographs of the site. Um, the first one, you can see the this um, property on on the left, uh, and on the right, they're they're both are proposed to be uh, removed. And on the second slide is just the, the the property on the right that is is part of the uh, the project. But it also shows a shared driveway uh, that exists right now. And the third photograph is a picture of uh, the property from Pugsley. So the plan development is asking for three modifications. One is lack of street frontage from all these units that are not gonna have street frontage, just the ones facing 300 West. Additional 10 parking spaces from what the maximum is required and uh, a five uh, foot encroachment on these units on facing 300 West uh, because of the um, it, because it will encroach the, the front yard setback. This is the preliminary subdivision that they're requesting. The landscape plan for this prop, uh, project shows um, two additional trees um, and then also trees uh, those two additional trees are going to be on the parking uh, parks park strip and um, three additional trees uh, buffering uh, some guest parking on the on the project then uh, you know smaller trees uh, on the edges of the buildings in the corner of the buildings here and then mostly uh, shrubs that are going to be facing the the entrance of the of the units. This is some of the rendering uh, rendering of the project how it's going to look. Uh, the materials are going to be fiber cement lap siding on this darker part, uh, stucco on this lighter part, cedar siding. Um, and then a brick veneer on the ground floor. I am including a couple of issues that were uh, addressed in this project. And the first one is that this project was um, um, started last year, but um, was pulled back because of the the um, applicant is including an additional property here. So um, as you can see, you know some of the main changes on this project from what was presented before uh, to the community council, uh, not to the planning commission though. It was to retain the shared driveway on the south. This driveway here, uh, um, there will be two um, proposed two driveways uh, access from um, 
300 bus. And the project also creates this courtyard. As part of uh, these two accesses from um, 300 West, um, the applicant had to ask for approval um, from UDOT and UDOT approved uh, with the condition that this North access here would be an entrance only. And then the other two, uh, two axes would be uh, an entrance and an exit. The reason for leaving this access open here, uh, going through to Pugsley is because of fire um, access and traffic. Um, another one is um, staff work with um, the applicant to create more of a, a feeling that the, the unit the units facing 300 West and Pugsby Street had more of a presence as a front facade. And so um, um, one of the things that, you know, some of the things that uh, this project added was um, a balcony with more of a um, front entrance and additional windows uh, on, on the front uh, facade of the, the project. Um, and the lack of street frontage is another issue. Um, you know, the, the, there's only these three or five units that are going to have street frontage, but, uh, the project does provide circulation to, uh, to vehicles, um, and there's pedestrian circulation through these, uh, this sidewalk system within the project. Another issue that has been um, brought up by uh, the residents um, that face Pugsley is that they are concerned that with this new project, uh, there's going to be additional uh, traffic, addi uh, additional parking, and and that would bring, uh, you know, also additional needed maintenance on Pugsley. And Pugsley is a private uh, road. It's not a public street. So um, these maintenance issues uh, need to be addressed by um, the um, property owners um, abutting Pugsley. And uh, as something else that I would like to point out here is, the, is that the applicant is working with some of the property owners to help them um, fix some of these, um, um, uh, you know, the, these, um, potholes and also creating more of a circulation uh, that would decrease some of the the the, the uh, traffic on Pugsley. The last issue is the tree on the park strip uh, and um, that tree uh, is has been okayed by urban forestry to be moved or replaced and um, the applicant is willing to provide two additional trees in place of this one. Um, our rec the planning um, staff recommendation is to approve this project sub subject to the following conditions uh, that are listed in the staff report and that is to submit a final subdivision plat, to record a document that discloses future private infra infrastructure costs, uh, record documentation that establishes an entity to manage uh, the private infrastructure in compliance with all other uh, city department conditions. Uh, now, an, an additional condition that uh, was a requirement 
request from the property owner that shares Celeste Sky Lane, which is the, the driveway uh, on the south. It's an existing easement, but uh, according to documents that I received yesterday, um, was that, you know, this easement has not uh, the, the, the applicant and the property owner, Mr. Carmen, uh, who owns this property here in the South, they have been in negotiation, um, with, uh, to, uh, just, uh, change the, the, you know, record a new easement, um, and they would like, uh, Mr. Carmen would like the execution and recording of a new easement on the South Shear driveway together with provision of title insurance to be added as a condition of approval for this plan development. And with that, uh, I end my presentation and um, would like to ask if anyone has questions or clarifications. Hey, commissioners, any question for staff at this time? Okay. Katya, so since Pugsley Street is a private street, was that just a plotted street from when this area was originally developed and never dedicated to the city? Is that its origin? Correct. Whoever developed uh, the properties along Pug Pugsley never uh, decided never to um, create a street and deed it to the street uh, to the city. So it just became a private road. Okay, thanks for that. Anyone else? And I one follow up question is is the landowner for Celeste Sky Lane here to talk more about the specifics of their requested condition? Um, Mr. Rick Carmen said that he would be here at this meeting. Okay, I'll say any do, other questions. There. I do say that, I, pardon me, I do see that name in the attendee list. Richard Carmen. Okay. Okay. All, right. okay. All right, let's move on to the applicant. We have Mr. Paul Garbett. Um, you will have 10 minutes and if you want to share your screen, I believe you do so you have presenter rights now. I just passed those along to you. Okay. Paul. Yep. Got him. Hey, okay. everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Your uh, 10 minutes starts now. All right. All sounds right. good. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to present to you. Let me. Got a. PDF presentation that I'd like to, to share and go into a little bit more detail about the type of homes that we're going to be, uh, that we wanna build here. So the name of the project is, um, is Azure Place and that's, that name is meant to just convey um, what we do at Garbat, which is we try and build the most energy efficient and sustainable homes that we can at an attainable price. Um, and, you know, as part of the plan development, you're, you're required to go above and beyond with certain metrics. And one of the main ones, you know, that I wanted to focus on was our, was our sustainability. Every home that we build is a, is a high performance home. Um, and this graphic here illustrates some of the, some of the things that we include in every single home and that we will be including here in in our Azure Place development. So each unit is pre-wired for solar. It makes it really seamless to come in and add solar panels um, to your home. The increased insulation is a technique and innovations that we've been de developing for over the past 10 years. Um, you get a lot of mileage out of just increasing your insulation um, to make your homes more energy efficient. And, saves you a lot of money on on heating and cooling and makes for a more sustainable home um, innovative framing techniques where we've this, 
you know, we space out studs so that you can fit in more insulation instead of using a standard two by four, we're using two by sixes on exterior walls, increasing surface areas for that insulation to have more of an impact throughout the entire home. Um, every home comes with an ERV system. And what that does is it circulates. Well, because our homes are so tight and so energy efficient, we need to be constantly circulating new clean air from, from the outside. So the ERV system does exactly that runs 24 seven, brings in new air, new air filtered and, and dispels with the old air. So we're constantly cycling that air through these homes um, while fil filtering it. Um, we have high performance windows and lights, um, high performance heating and cooling, tankless water heaters, water heaters and eco-friendly materials. Um, one thing that we do is we participate in, in uh, in the zero energy ready program, which is a national or federal program that certifies and individually checks each home, making ensuring that it is it is going above and beyond those requirements that we have, for example, in the Utah Building Code. Um, so it's a third party entity that verifies that you are building to a much higher standard and certifies each home. Um, we live in a time when there's a lot of greenwashing, so people can say, oh yeah, my home is energy efficient. But what we, we decided to focus on metrics and, and the best metric to, to measure the sustainability and the energy efficiency of a home is called the HERS rating score. And what that does is basically tells you how much energy you're, you're consuming and how efficient your home is. If you look at this graph, so a zero energy home, gets a score of a zero, closer to zero, the better. That means you're producing as much energy as you're using. A typical standard new home built to Utah code would be somewhere in the 90s. These homes we anticipate being in the upper 40s, low 50s. So a very significant improvement in energy efficiency. Um, these are just a couple of examples of recent homes that we built um, in this neighborhood. Uh, well, in the Marmalade neighborhood, scores of 41 and 42. Um, also, we want to be mindful of, of the landscaping. And so we have moved to a local scape model with all of our homes where we plant more indigenous plants that are lower maintenance and have greater water savings while still maintaining that curb appeal that our buyers want. Within the homes, we have a number of systems that we've adopted that also save water, these tankless water heaters, low flow of toilets and faucets and energy star appliances, you know, refrigerators and freezers, all of which contribute to greater sustainability. Um, this is the site plan that Katjez has gone over with you. Um, so just the summary of that is 37 new homes to this area. Uh, we have two different floor plans. We have two car garage with a two bedroom and a one car garage with a one bedroom. So this larger two car garage home will be about 11, almost 1200 square feet. While the one smaller one car, one bedroom will be just under a thousand square feet. So smaller, smaller homes, but ultra efficient. Um, and here's some renderings. Um, just a modern contemporary style that I think adds some variety and, and diversity to the, the block space in this neighborhood. Um, this style obviously is, I think, creates an eclectic mix here in the, in the marmalade and surrounding areas that, that the area has been kind of come to be known for. Uh, modern definitely appeals to many of our buyers that are looking to live closer to downtown. Um, here you can see one of those, that deck that faces towards 300, um, you know, just bringing more presence to that street face and making it more welcoming and inviting. Um, I really like this, this courtyard. I think it'll really contribute to the, the streetscape um, for not just the residents, but those walking by. Um, the floor plans, two car garage, these are gonna be three stories. Um, main level and then the two bedrooms on the on the top level. And this is the plan for the one car garage. It's just under a thousand square feet with a master bedroom at the top level. 
and some of the material charts that we're planning to use, cedar siding, fiber cement, uh, brick veneer, stucco. Uh, I think we're incorporating a lot of good variety and some great design elements that will really make for an attractive and an exciting community. Um, this is the, the plat, shows some of that, that easement agreement that we worked out with uh, Mr. Carmen to the south of us. I believe he'll be talking a little bit more about that. Um, and then our landscaping plan. Um, the goal here is to just make it as attractive and, and green as possible and preserving as much open space as we can and, and getting nice, nice plants that will add to the feel of the community. Um, and I, yeah, that's basically my pr presentation. Um, we're really excited about this. I, I think you guys are as aware as I am that right now there's a desperate need for housing. Um, I live in this neighborhood. I'm part of this, of this, this area. Um, I can speak for a number of people that are desperate to find affordable or attainable housing that they can move into and be close to Salt Lake City. Um, so we're excited to make this opportunity available to them. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you, Mr. Garvet. Um, commissioners, any questions for the applicant at this time? Okay, I would uh, like to hear more about the easement. Um, what is the current easement and why did you need to renegotiate it? So, okay, sorry. Are you able to still see my site plan? Sorry, I switched yes, it to the are. Monitor. Okay, so originally there was an existing easement that ran approximately kind of in the middle of the road down to about here that the Carmen's had on, that was on our side of the property. Um, I think it just presented a lot of challenges. Um, Carmen uses it for his business. Um, he's bringing trucks in there to unload and unload refrigeration equipment. So I approached them with the idea that we will improve this road. Um, and, you know, it will be wider than it currently is and give him full access to you to use this easement here. Um, mm -hmm in exchange for our residents also being able to use it because his easement ended approximately right here. So you kind of have this pinch right here where this curb is and there was kind of a fence there. Um, Cause then the easement stopped right here and then you would have to observe our property line that's right here at the, at the bottom. Um, it also, when we reoriented the buildings, um, it creates this nice courtyard and it just, I feel like made a lot more sense to, for our residents to share this road with, with uh, Mr. Carmen. Okay, are you adverse to um, the possibility of adding a condition that the easement is recorded? Yeah, no, we, I've talked to, uh, Mr. Carmen and his attorney today, um, we're all, I believe we're all on the same page. The plan was to record the easement when we get final plat approval or prior to any financing on it. Um, I wanted to definitely record it after meeting the planning commission, um, you know, just pending our, uh, the verdict that we get today. So. Okay. Um, so to make it a condition. Yeah. Okay. Did, did a commissioner have a follow up question on the easement? Or anything else? Um, I have, do you know, understand what um, the requirement for title insurance is? That's not normally something we get into. Did, right. did this landowner discuss that with you? Yeah, we've been discussing it. So we're, yeah, we're planning on uh, having title insurance be part of our, part of that easement. Okay, um, so yeah, I would I say like for our purposes, that's not really 
right. I don't know that we want to get into that. I mean, I think the recording of the easement makes sense as a condition, but yeah, yeah. I think the rest of it, I agree with you, Adrian. It's that it's is a little way purview. beyond our purview. Yeah, yeah, we don't get into that. No. I do have um, a question about Pugsley Street. And I'm curious, and I mean, I guess this is a question for both planning staff as well as for the applicant. Why a condition of, a, of approval wasn't added to require upgrades to that street since it's used as a means of both ingress and egress for this project? I mean, and I understand you've been in discussions with the landowners on doing that um, and wanted to get your sense first if would be opposed to having that as a condition and then I'd like staffs at some point to to respond to that question as well. Mr. Gerbeck, oh, you okay. Yeah, um, so what we've expressed that we're willing to do is um, is patch up the potholes that exist on Pugsley. Um, I think that'll make it a, a significant improvement on the condition of the road and just increase its its durability for years to come. Um, we've also discussed our support for changing Pugsley into a one-way road, um, which would also help to, I think, address some of the traffic concerns on Pugsley Street. Um, Katya, do you have anything to add? Uh, other than, um, you know, uh, fixing, you know, some of the main maintenance issues like potholes, um, I think um, it's hard to make those conditions because this is a private, a private street. It's not a public street, but um, I think that uh, planning staff has no problem with, you know, adding that condition of, you know, um, uh, working. But it's a private, but isn't it needed for fire access too, Katya? So, I mean, there is a public interest as well. As, is that right? Yes, correct. You know, um, but uh, I, I'm curious to uh, understand more what kind of um, maintenance are you or or work on Pugsley Street are you um, would like, you know, trying to figure out or, or asking about? Well, I would think fixing the potholes as a minimum, but ensuring that the, the road is actually um, serviceable by fire safety vehicles, if they haven't already confirmed that. Yeah, I, I know that fire has, I've reviewed this site plan a number of times with fire. This is the version that they, they have a, given me their verbal approval, uh, approval on. Um, I'm not sure if they've driven Pugsley or not, um, but I think with the addition of, of those most significant repairs in the road, patching up the potholes, it will serve very well as emergency vehicle access in addition to the two access points that you have here along 300 West. Um, so I think, you know, we've got three different options for emergency vehicle access. And I think the most, the one that they were most focused on was along 300 West. Um, so it makes it easy to exit off of Pugsley, but it's also, you know, you can back out, turn around here off of the, off of this kind of this T here and or circle back out and exit from 300 West. And fire is aware of uh, our request, uh, you know, for Pugsley Street, you know, to use Pugs, Pugsley Street and they, uh, it, it has been brought to their attention several times that this is a private road and uh, confirmation that, you know, they will be able to use Pugsley as an access for fire. Okay, thank you. Um, any other questions from commissioners? 
Um, so I actually, Ms. Margaret, would like to see a rendering of what the Pugsley Street site looks like. This would be the Pugsley Street side. That's the entire bit. It, wouldn't there be more on the uh, other side? Uh, so, yeah, so there's, it's kind of an angled view. So you have the, the row of homes on the south and then the row on the north. This is adjacent property. Oh, um, all right. Existing home and okay. as well as this is where the condominiums are. Um, one of the things I would um, perhaps like to see on, especially the, this side looks good, but on the 300 West side, um, I like the balcony. And I know that's one of the, you know, the questions before us is to allow you a reduced front yard setback to um, allow for those jet out balconies. Um, but I'm wondering if um, on the ground, you can't maybe do a little bit more to delineate the entrance, like their their kind of outdoor space. So I've seen some stuff recently where there's like a little fencing outside their front door and it just adds that appeal that this is your entrance. Um it so that's Pugsley. If you went to your renderings for the 300 west side, which I have on page three, I think. So if that's the So it looks like we just have like balcony door. If there's something you can do to delineate the outdoor space by the entrance to make it feel like more of an entrance. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I I think part of the problem with this is the is the renderings kind of overshadow it quite a bit. Um, we've talked about just a wraparound porch that extends further the width of the home here. Uh, kind of along the bottom. Once you have that and, and the patio furniture, I think there will be no mistaking that this is this is the main entrance. It'll be very street facing. Um, so I think just the placement of these trees isn't 100% accurate to where we will be. I think it'll make a lot more sense built. But if there are some ideas that staff has of what we could do to improve, we're happy to entertain. Yeah, that. I think on the Pedestrian level, so on that street level, there needs to be a little bit more effort done on making it feel like more of an entrance than balcony above. And I got a door here. Do you, if you understand what I'm getting at? Right. right. And and we are extending that. So you kind of have a step up, and then there is a patio space okay. on that main level as well. Okay. That makes sense. So. Okay. okay. Any other questions from commissioners before I open the public hearing? Very well, um, so we're going to open the public hearing for this agenda item. Um, if you are interested in speaking, please raise your hand um, at the bottom. And uh, do we have Wayne, a representative from the Capitol Hill Community Council? We do, <clears throat> excuse me, we actually have two. We have David Shear, who's the, um, the chair, um, and then uh, Brian Hutchinson, who's part of the Transportation Committee. So I'm gonna call in David Shear first. Yeah, so one of you will get five minutes. The other one will get two. So, um, so David, uh, we'll I five minutes for the community council. If David wants to speak up right now and say Brian's going to get those five minutes, then we'll switch them out. But um, if it's okay, can can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If it's okay with Brian, I'll take the five minutes. Okay, well, you're the chair, so we're going to give you that. Um, after you are done, um, other public comments, you have two minutes to speak. Uh, and I do time you all to try to be fair. So the five minutes are yours now, Mr. Shear. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's fair to say this project has created quite a lot of heartburn in the community. Uh, we want the housing. Uh, we admire the architectural qualities of the project. We want to replace the existing blighted structures that would be uh, torn down. On the other hand, Pugsley Street is really a problem. Um, there are people among us who would question uh, Ms. Pace's assertion that this street was never public. Um, unfortunately, the relevant documents apparently were destroyed in a flood. 
Um, as far as fire access goes, the turning radii that are shown between the Project Street and Pugsley are far too small to accommodate emergency vehicles. Perhaps they're planning on fighting fires from Pugsley itself and running hoses into the development. Um, but if you read the letter from the fire department that's in your packet, you'll see that the radii shown are do not meet their standards. Um, Pugsley is a private street. It's a confused situation. Some of the parcels extend into what was the right of way. Some are bordered by it. Um, it's only 20 feet wide. It has no sidewalks, so vehicular and pedestrian traffic are combined. It is not maintained. It's in extremely poor condition. It has no strain, storm drainage, and there are several houses that front on it and have access only from it so, and need it for parking because they have no off-street parking. It's also a cut through uh, traffic opportunity that people use to avoid the light at 6th North and 3rd West, um, which can create a substantial delay. So residents there already endure safety hazards and nuisance uh, from noise, cars cutting through at all days, at all times of the day and night. Um, if you went and looked at it, you would see something that would really shock you. This is a black eye for the city of Salt Lake. It's a third world looking street that has, should not exist in a modern city like ours. Um, the residents on the street have tried repeatedly to get the city to take possession of it and improve it without success. They've been told that they need to raise $2 million to bring the street up to city standards. And if you look at the homes, you will see that this is so far out of reach for the residents that it's practically an insult to even bring it up with them. The project will add about 250 daily vehicle trips calculated by standard planning methods. As a result, the project will add considerable traffic to Pugsley Street and exacerbate the existing hazards and nuisances from cut through traffic. Um, I've talked with Mr. Garbett, and he has acknowledged these hazards and nuisances and has agreed to take several measures, which you've already heard, to mitigate them, mainly, uh, namely making Pugsley Street one way northbound uh, to, while they're in possession of the project before they sell it, to use their influence to help the residents of Pugsley Street persuade the city to take possession of it, um, to perform temporary repairs, as you heard, and if a funding mechanism were found to allow the upgrade of the street, they have said that they will pay their share of the cost of improving the street based on their portion of the frontage. I believe these commitments will improve the conditions on Pugsley Street and mitigate the hazards and nuisances that the residents there currently have to endure. So I urge the commission to make these commitments formal conditions for the approval of these applications. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Wayne, who's next? Uh, Brian Hutchinson. Okay, Brian, you're up. You have two minutes. Please Hello, state your uh, name for the record. Yes, it's Brian Hutchinson. I'm the uh, chair of the Transportation Committee for the Capitol Hill Neighborhood Council. And uh, Paul, we met a couple years ago at Black Diamond. I don't know if you remember, but uh, yeah, uh, we uh, you know applaud the uh, architectural. Uh, efforts, the design efforts, but one thing that I should point to is the street topologies and street and intersection topologies plan of, of transfer of Salt Lake Transportation Division. Uh, there and also uh, the Capitol Hill traffic calming plan uh, that is going through the approval process right now. These uh, are meant to uh, restore uh, neighborhood livability and David uh, spoke to some of the problems we currently have. Immediate neighbors, neighbors uh, in the houses on Pugsley, uh, but also the apartments to the north have a, a growing number of children uh, and they, uh, they're they working closely with the city transportation on, on re redesigning the street at 700 North with bulb outs and uh, other traffic calming measures. This this uh, this triangle is basically separated from the rest of the neighborhood because of the traffic mayhem uh and we urge garbage to join us in the campaign to lower the speed on 300 west to 30 miles an hour but more importantly uh the apartments the hoas don't want any egress or uh, ingress on pugsley because what it would do is exacerbate a, a a traffic problem 
uh, that threatens pedestrians and the children, as I say, that, that play on 700 North and, and Pugsley. The patching, a couple hundred dollars worth of patching on Pugsley or a $2 million improvement of the road is not a panacea. It actually invites more conflict. And so we urge a, a formal uh, transportation uh, circulation plan that involves only 300 West. Uh, Pugsley would be for emergencies only. I think that's um, time, Mr. Hutchins. And thank, th thank you, you very much. <laughs> okay. Thank you for uh, your comments. Let's talk comments. later, Paul. Thanks. Who's up next, Wayne? Okay. How about um, Greta Spenlov? Okay, Greta, okay. if you would state your name for the record, and then you have two minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. I'm Greta Spendlove, and I'm the attorney for Richard and Mary Carmen, and they are the owners to the south of the project. Uh, and uh, as as Mr. Garbett acknowledged, we've been um, the, the Carmens originally had a dispute about their easement and the placement of the project across the easement. We've resolved that. We've prepared uh, an easement agreement. Uh, which Ms. Mr. Garbett has is, is acknowledged that he's willing to have that, uh, in, have the recording of that easement agreement uh, specified as a condition to approval of the plat. And that is what we want. Um, we would, he also indicated that our agreement is that it will be recorded upon final approval of the plat or such earlier time as he obtains financing. And, and we'd like to have that included. Our concern is, is we want to make sure that, that, uh, that the, the easement has first position against the property. Uh, it, it's, it's access that's extremely important to the Carmens, and we don't want to have a, a situation in which he, uh, there's a possibility of, of you know, prior financing that, that forecloses our easement. And so, so the, the timing of that of recording prior to his getting financing is an extremely important part of the deal. And, and my understanding is that he's okay with that. Uh, and, and we'd like that listed as a, as a condition. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Ms. Finlow. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, next is uh, Jeff Carleton. Hey, Jeff, if you would state your name for the record, you'll have two minutes, go ahead. Absolutely. Thank you, commissioners. My name is Jeff Carlton. I own a business just a couple blocks away. Um, and I just wanted to state my support for this project. We feel that Azure Place is a much welcome improvement to an underutilized and transitional area in the community. We appreciate uh, the density of this development. We like the architecture. This Pugsley and this private road matter, uh, to David's point, it, this street belongs in a third world country, not in Salt Lake City. Um, you know, the issues around that are going to take a while to get resolved. Uh, and we think that the the folks that are living in that development will most likely not utilize that road because it's such a mess. Um, but at the same time, we don't think the developers should be responsible for um, resolving that issue. Um, in terms of safety, lighting and occupancy in this area, it's, it's dark. There are very few residences. Uh, we think that extra lighting and occupancy will help us with some of the low level crime we've been experiencing in the area. And as a final comment, we just like to welcome this development and the residents that are going to support uh, our local businesses um, uh, to the area. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Mr. Carlton. And just a reminder to uh, the public, if you have spoken, if you would please unclick that hand at the bottom, that will help us know who's already um, had their turn. All right, Wayne. Uh, next, Jeremy Harris. All right, Mr. Harris, please state your name for the record and you'll have two minutes. Go ahead. I'm Jeremy Harris. Thank you for uh, listening to me. I also submitted some written comments. Um, I like some of the comments I've heard tonight. Um, I agree. I think Garbett would be a good partner to have on the Pugsley Street problem. This has been an issue for many years. Um, I, I disagree a little bit with some of the characterizations about cut through traffic and children on Pugsley Street. The only pedestrians I really see walking through Pugsley Street are uh, drug uh, buyers going to and from a drug house on the street. I take my dog down there every night. I've never seen children playing on that street, at least on this end closer to 700 North. 
So I just think it would be good to have Garbett on board as a partner for what to do. I think their offer to do temporary patches on the street is good. That might solve the short-term problem and the long-term problems are gonna take some involvement from the city. I don't think a cut through street that has 16 adjacent properties should be a private road. I think the city should, but I think that's a fight for another day. And I think Azure Place is a reasonable proposal that should be approved tonight so that they can move forward and it would be a very welcome addition to the neighborhood. I didn't state this at the beginning, but I am an adjacent uh, resident. I own one of the condos in the condo association next door to where this development would be. So I just, I, I encourage you to approve it. Garbett seems like they are good neighbors to have. They'd be good partners to help solve this uh, Pugsley Street problem. And I don't see any reason that the commission should uh, turn them away tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. I appreciate your comments. Next up, Wayne. Uh, next is Richard Carmen. All right, Mr. Carmen, please state your name for the record and go ahead. You're up. Thank you for hearing me. My name is Richard Carmen, and my family has been involved in that area clear back into the early 40s. Uh, and speaking on that, my agreement with Paul and that, we, we've got that all worked out. I'm not worried about my easement. What I find fascinating is the discussion about Pugsley Street being a non-public road. I find that hysterical. And here's my reasoning why. Number one, it's named a street, not a way, not a place, not a lane. It's a street. Back in the 1940s, my mom, the Garrett's, lived on that street. The neighbors got together and deeded their property back to the city so they could city could come in and fix the street and put sidewalks in it. Now, I heard earlier somebody say that records were destroyed by a flood at some time. That could be, but it falls on the city's responsibility to go back to the original property owners as best they can to reconstruct those records. And those records, and if you want a witness to it, you, we can be, I'll be happy to bring my mom up for you. She's 83, but she was there when the neighbors made the discussion about deeding the property back to the city for, de for development by the city. So Pugsley is a, is, is a street. It's not an alley. It's not privately owned. It never has been. That's how the neighborhood viewed it. And that's how it's been since the 1940s and the city failed to follow through on their obligations. Thanks for hearing me out. All right, thank you, Mr. Carmen. Anyone else, Wayne? You know, I do not see any more hands raised. Um, and, and like you mentioned, we received a, a number of public comments or emailed comments um, that have all been forwarded to you over the last couple of days. Yes, um, they were in our draft box. Yeah, I don't see any new emails that have come in tonight and no additional hands raised. Okay, and Mr. Carmen, if you would just click that hand at the bottom to un unclick it so we know that you've spoken, um, that would be helpful. All right, with that, I will close. Thank you. I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the commission. Um, uh, Mr. Garbett, would you like to take a moment to respond to anything of the public comments? Um, yeah, just that we, you know, it's been working with Rick and so we're, we're happy to uh, make that a requirement to, to record it um, at final plat approval or prior to any financing. And um, yeah, it just, you know, addressing Pugsley, um, I think I think fixing the potholes, that's, that's obviously the most glaring problem that needs to be addressed. And we are committed to work with the neighborhood to improve this, this block. And that includes working on this on Pugsley Street and, and going through the appropriate avenues and channels to see what we can do as far as getting the city to help out with it. Okay, thank you. Uh, commissioners, this time, if you have any further questions for the applicant or staff or thoughts slash concerns, um, please go ahead. So I would support including a condition that upgrades are made to public Pugsley Street so that the potholes are fixed and there's a, you know, a level um, paved surface that's accessible by the proposed residents. Um, and also I would include the condition of the recording of the easement along with the recording of the plot. Okay. 
Uh, okay, I would entertain a motion if there's no other discussion, but I think those are uh, amenable additional conditions. Uh, Thank you. This is, yes. this is Nick. Can I just yes. have a, I have a clarifying question on yes. where that Southern road curves and it looks like it's outside of the area of the easement, but it also looks like it leaves the subject property. Can we make sure that that's, and it might've been addressed earlier, but I wasn't quite clear. Can we make sure that that's addressed on the record to make sure that we're not approving some access road on someone's property that isn't subject to that, to some other agreement, legal agreement? Would you require road? that as an additional condition? Well, I don't know that we- Sorry. Let's Sorry, ask for a clarification, but if um, if it's if there's not something there, then we can't require something on someone else's property that isn't part of it. So I right. I, I want to make sure that's clarified. All right, Mr. Garvey, can you clarify that that access and that curved southern part is entirely your property? Um, it is part of the easement agreement. So if I sorry, one sec, let me share this with you. Um, is this, let's see, I believe this is the area you're referring to. Nick, is, is that where you're referring? Cor correct. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure true. that it's on the record that that's part of. That's part of, of the, that easement. Yeah, this okay. shaded area is the easement agreement that's on, on Rick Carmen's property. So it would be part of the easement agreement. Does that satisfy you, Nick? Yeah, yeah, I just want to, like I said, make sure that we've addressed it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone ready to make a motion? Or do you have more uh, thoughts you want to discuss? I'm willing to make a motion. Go ahead, Adrian. Okay, based on the information and in the staff report, the information presented and the input received during the public hearing, I move that the Planning Commission approve PLN PCM 2021-00248, PLN SUB 2021-00242 as a replace plan development and preliminary subdivision with the conditions listed in the staff report. Um, as well as with the following conditions that the applicant is required to upgrade Pugsley Street by uh, fixing existing potholes and creating a level paved surface along the stretch of Pug Pugsley Street, and that the applicant is required to record an access easement or along the southern boundary of the property covering all areas um, shown on the site plan where we see encroachments on the adjacent property and the easement is to be recorded along with the recording of the plot. Sorry, it was a bit wordy. Do I have a second? Second. I'll second. Is that John? Yeah, Adrian, I have a question. Yeah. Sure. Uh -huh. Um, you said recorded with the plat, and I think the other requirement Greta was asking for was recorded with the plat or before any financing is recorded. I don't see that as our issue. If they want to uh, address subordination provisions in their easement agreement, that's between them. Our concern is that the easement is granted along with the recording of the plot. Okay. Commissioner Bell, this is Hannah Vickery. Um, I do have one suggestion um, as it relates to the condition to um, make the improvements to Pugsley. I think we could also allow the posting for an adequate um, public infrastructure surety, um, whether it be in a bond or whatever form the city allows um, so that the subdivision to be recorded um, prior to the improvements being made. Just make that suggestion. I'm I'm fine with that. 
that provision to the condition. Do you, does that mean you have to restate that condition? I hope not, but I can. <laughs> <Fair>. <laughs> So just either that the improvements are made or an adequate um, public infrastructure surety is posted. Right, such that the improvements could be made following the reporting of the plot. Okay, John, are you still okay with seconding that? Yes. Okay, any question, further questions? All right, then we'll do our um, our roll call. Carolyn. Did I lose Carolyn? I might have lost her. We'll come back to that. She was she was on mute. I just unmuted her. So let's see if that. OK, OK, Carolyn. Yes, agree. <laughs> Wonderful. John? Yes. Yes. Sarah? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Uh, Andres? I will vote. I will. Yeah. A little uneasy about Pugsley, but I think that's outside of the scope of this particular application. So I'll vote yes. Okay. And Adrian? Yes. Okay. That passes unanimously. Mr. Garbetcher, uh, Good to go. Good luck on your project. Um, we will now move on to our third agenda item. Thank which, you. You're welcome. Which is do, 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 do. the um, alley vacation of uh, PLN PCM 20. Okay, I think this is wrong. It's just 2021, not 2020 21, correct? <laughs> Oh dear, no, that's no. correct. Okay. Uh, PLN PCM 2021-00413 Kensington Bryan Avenue's 1200 block alley vacation. And we have the presenter as Aaron. Hi, thank Hello. you. Uh, good evening. This is a request to vacate an unused alley on the 1200 block between Bryan and Kensington Avenues from 1300 East down to the McClellan Trail. Uh, we have received a few comments concerned that the request was to vacate the actual trail. That is not the request in this case, the area highlighted in purple on your screen or pink, hard to say, magenta, fuchsia, um, is not part of this request only the area outlined in red. Uh, along with the report, the comments in the report, staff received three additional comments. Uh, one was from the East Liberty Park Community Organization, Jason Stevenson. Um, and one was opposed to this request and the other two were in support of it. The comments in opposition of this as well as engineering's comments boiled down to um, opposition to vacating any sort of public property to private individuals. Uh, but as part of a alley vacation, we need to stick to the standards that are presented in the staff report. And because of those standards, staff recommends approval for this request. Uh, with the condition that a utility easement is established in place of the existing public alley right of way to accommodate uh, power lines that run through there currently, they're private power lines. They do not; they only serve residents of the block along here. That, but uh, we're in discussions with Rocky Mountain Power. There was that request to establish a utility easement on there, and our real estate services is confident that that is. A process that they can move forward if the request is approved by the city council. And that's the end of my presentation. Happy to answer any questions. Aaron, I think that's a record for the shortest staff presentation. Nice. Um, okay, commissioners, any questions for staff? All right, then we'll move along. I think we have uh, Mr. Stephen Black, who is the petitioner. 
Uh, Mr. Black, do you have a presentation you want to give, uh, like where you need uh, to share your screen, or would you just like to? I, I've shared the uh, the presentation, uh, the slide that I made with Aaron, and I'll just let him show it and display it. Yes, okay. let me pull it up. Yeah, pull that up for him, and then. Uh... Okay. There it is. It's one page. There we go. All right, Mr. Black, you have 10 minutes, but feel free. You don't need to use them all, but it's up to you. You're up. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Steve Black. It's a pleasure to speak with you regarding my application to have the city vacate the east west alley between 13th east and 12th east the mcclellan trail and bordered by the homes on kensington bryan avenue as aaron mentioned the slide uh, shows the affected neighborhood it's the same same slide that aaron used and uh, i've highlighted the homeowners in pink that uh, signed our petition to vacate this alley and we've also received uh, letters as aaron noted in support from the homeowners of this property or the, that are but this uh, alley uh, to support the uh, the vacation of this property. By vacating the alley, this will allow the property owners to build on this land and incorporate it into their uh, backyard living spaces. And I also think um, the easement will be an improvement for Rocky Mountain Power. Right now, they don't have any access to this alley um, because it was never constructed without going through the homes or through the yards and by including an easement that will solve that problem for them. I appreciate your consideration and I'm happy to answer any questions. I'm sure I think you're on mute. I am, you know, it's that additional speaker. I got to turn both of them on and I forgot. Um, do any commissioners have any questions for the applicant? Okay, I have one question. So if we have an easement, it looks like we already have quite an encroachment. I think it's from 1542, 1300 East with probably a garage. Yeah, there's there's significant encroachment all along the alley, just simply yeah. because it's, it was never constructed. And I don't think people realized that it was even there. I didn't oh. until I had my property surveyed when I purchased it. Yeah. And what is your address, Mr. Black? I need well, just twelve thirty six. Your twelve thirty six. Okay, there you are. Um, so do people understand that uh, recording an easement may require them to do some modifications of their structures? Uh, what do you mean? This my understanding of the utility easement is that as long as the power company can access the power lines, there's no impact having buildings there. It's a requirement, simple requirement of, of being able to access. For example, in my yard, the telephone pole uh, in the mid block is in my backyard, which I, I'll, I'll have a driveway and easy access up to it that isn't currently there. Okay. Right. Any other questions from commissioners? All right. With that, I will uh, open the public hearing. Wayne, do we have? Anyone from the community council? I'm not sure which one this falls in. It's East Liberty Park and Wasatch Hollow. It's near both yeah. of those. I don't see um, names from either of those. Um, I do see Judy Short in the list, who's kind of in this area. So maybe hey, I'll I unmute her. her. Yeah. Judy, did you want to speak on any of these? You know, I really didn't, although I'm part of the Elko land use committee. Because this is Emerson is my neighborhood. Um, okay, I think we're all in favor of it. It doesn't seem to have ever been really constructed properly like an alley. It's just sort of there. Which is why there's a lot of encroachment because people didn't realize it was an alley. Okay. All right, thank you, Judy. Um, I don't see any hands raised. So if you are um, attending and you wish to speak, please take a moment to raise that hand, hit that hand on the bottom. Otherwise, uh, any other comments you've received, Wayne? We have not received any comments. 
We did have some comments in our Dropbox that were additional or that were sent after the fact, after the staff, the report was published. Other than that, nothing? Uh, nothing that we've received tonight, no. Okay, I will close the public hearing, bring it back to the commissioners. You can raise questions, comments, or I am willing to entertain a motion. I'll make a motion, Madam right. Chair, Vice Thank Chair, you. excuse me. Okay. okay. Um, this is for Kensington Avenue Alley Vacation Petition Number PLNPCM 2021-00413. <clears throat> Based on the findings and analysis in the staff report, the policy commission considerations for alley vacation and the input received, I move that the planning commission forward a positive recommendation to the city council for the alley vacation proposed in PLN PCM 2021-00413 with the condition listed in the staff report. Thank you. Do I have I'll a second? second? I'll second. Maureen? All right, I have a motion from Carolyn and a second from Maureen. Let's go. Do you have any questions? Let's go ahead for our vote. Andreas. Uh, yes, I'll vote yes. Thank you. Sarah? Uh, no. Okay. John? Yes. Carolyn? I'll agree. Adrian? Yes. And Maureen. Yes. Yes. Okay, we have five yes and one no. So that motion does pass. All right, Mr. Black, you are uh, good luck with the city council. Um, we're going to move forward to our last item. I just want to double check with uh, commissioners. Are you okay to move forward with this one or do you want to take a quick break? Because we've been at it two hours. I've got one thumbs up. Okay, we'll do Let's it. Keep, going. keep it moving. Yeah, keep it moving. Excellent. I just like to double check. All right, we are going to move on to PLN PCM 2021-00540, a conditional use for auto impound lot. And we have the presenter as Anna. Or I mean the staff. Sorry, staff is Anna. Anna, you are on mute. I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. I could not. I already started sharing my screen and I couldn't get it unmuted. There you go. <laughs> okay, so um, let's do this is a request by West Coast Towing represented by Heather LeVay um, for conditional use approval to create and operate an automobile impound lot and outdoor storage of commercial vehicles such as semis and freight on an undeveloped parcel at approximately 1050 South 500 West. Outdoor storage is a permitted use and impound lots require conditional use approval in the CG zoning district subject to it being located at least a thousand feet from a single family or two family zoning district and conforming with the provisions in section 21A54 conditional uses. The location of the property is, um, is next to the underpass for I-15 at 500 West. It is adjacent to um, the railroad tracks um, and the freeway. The nearest intersections are 1300 south to the south and 900 south to the north. As part of the conditions are, uh, of approval, it needs to be a minimum of 1000 feet from any residential zone. And um, this is just demonstrating that. It's also showing what the surrounding zoning district is. Um, most of them are CG um, zones. And then, um, and then let's go ahead and move on to the next. Um, the applicant is proposing to use the existing fence and access off of 500 West. They are proposing to use compacted road base for the surface of the proposed impound lot. Um, 
for uh, uh, the issues of this development is that areas used for outdoor storage of vehicles are required to be fully hard surface for section 21A44020 F of city ordinance. Landscaping is required in the park stripped area um, in the and adjacent to the property and the 10 foot front yard setback requirement for the CG zone for section 21A48 of the zoning ordinance. Um, Another issue is the fencing uh, needs to be out of the 10 foot set yard uh, front yard setback requirement. Um, and then uh, it also needs to provide the 30 foot um, site distance triangle around the entrance to the impound lot. Um, The conditions of approval listed that I had listed in the staff report um, are, are requirements for uh, per ordinance for impound lots. Um, this means that even if this wasn't a conditional use, they would be required to to have um, put in these these uh, upgrades. Um, however, due to the lot being used for larger commercial vehicles, the applicant could obtain a special exception for non hard surface parking storage area for the vehicle if it meets the criteria for this type of exception, which is listed in this slide show. The lot is used for long term vehicle storage, not for regular parking. The vehicle stored are large and are on tracks. The parking surface is compacted with at least six inches of road base and then hard surf. Uh, uh, there needs to be some type of wash bay or something along those lines to prevent mud and sand from getting into the public right away. And then um, there needs to be 50 feet of driveway that um, uh, uh, from the public street property line. And then city transportation director director's approval is also required. Um, so, uh, the uh, the city or planning staff recommends approval um, based on the um, the conditions listed below that are required by ordinance. Are, are you finished, Anna? Uh, yes. You... Uh -huh. oh, okay. Um, all right. Sorry. Uh, commissioners, do you have any questions for Anna? Okay. I'm I'm now a little confused on the conditions. Is it just the three, or is it also those the five you had listed in the previous slide? You had five points just a minute ago. Oh, no, this is for the special exception approval. If if uh, she goes to special exception approval and doesn't get the hard surfacing, these are the requirements that she needs to make. Uh, it, okay. it, but it's not really that's not that's kind of kind of separate from what you guys um, need. It's just that I see. I uh, see. Okay. Yeah, I'm on board. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Great. I don't. Hear anything from commissioners, so we will move on to the applicant, Heather Levey. Um, it's, it's, you... it's Leva. Leva. Sorry. No, Leva. thank you for the correction. Yeah. Heather Leva, um, you are up. You should have presenter rights. If you have a presentation, you can share your screen. I, I think that we pretty much covered as far as what needs to be shown on the screen. Um, it's it's pretty simple. Um, you know, we're dedicated to leaving space better than we found it. Uh, we're looking to expand our stubborn, our coverage statewide. We're not a salvage or, or a dismantler. Uh, we're not in the business of being a junkyard. Uh, we're in the business of heavy duty commercial towing and recovery. We deal with freight semis, accident recovery, short term st storage of uh, commercial vehicles and their cargo. Uh, if approved, we plan to run power to the location um, that is at 1050 South and 500 West. Right now, it's a very dark corner. It's on the corner where um, the tracks meet, um, as you've seen on the on the screen. That it was a, it's a triangle piece of property. Um, the homeless are cutting the fence, and it is 
it's just a really dark place at night. We want to light it up. We want to make it bright. We want to make it a, a better place than where it's sitting right now and uh, help the city to, to clear that of the transient problem. Um, the transients have, like I said, been cutting the fence on the property and we um, are continuing to maintain that um, and, and show that we are a presence in the city. Um, we want it to be a bright, um, environment that is going to, uh, you know, keep our customers' equipment and uh, their cargo safe, um, and we're committed to that. Uh, the property is um, currently being. Uh, I, it's just a it's a vacant place, and it's it's just being used uh, as a, a pass through, really, for drug addicts and people who are down there doing things that are unscrupulous at night. And we want to help. We want to help just make sure that that is a is a better place and brighten it up and and make it a, a good part of the community. Okay. Thank you, um, commissioners. Any questions for um, Ms. Leva? All right. With that, I will open the public hearing. Um, again, Wayne, I'm not sure what community council this falls in, but. You know, I'm not seeing anybody that wishes to speak. Neither um, am I. On this item. Okay, and there were no comments in our uh, staff report in the drop box, so. Uh, actually, I did receive one comment stating that oh, they- I see it now. Yeah. Uh, from George Chapman, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, comment? I'm sorry, I didn't see that. We was we the, the yesterday. So oh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, we do have that in our drop box. All right, with that I will close the public hearing and bring it back to the commission. Any questions, concerns, thoughts? Commissioners, if I can jump in really fast and if um <clears throat> If the commissioners uh, decide to uh, go with approval on this project and read the motion sheet, I just kind of want to make a point of clarification on the conditions. And I, I think Anna did a good job on on this, but I want to clarify it a bit more. So that condition number one about the hard surfacing, um, the hard surfacing is actually an ordinance requirement. And then, um, as Anna mentioned, there's a process that the applicant can go through to try to get an exception to that ordinance requirement. The commission may want to consider excluding that condition from your motion. Um, and the reason for that is that if you if if you strictly say in that condition that they shall do that, it almost kind of prevents them from going for that exception. And it's a separate process. It can be reviewed. Um, just something to consider. Um, there's already ordinance requirements for hard surfacing, and those exceptions are already in the ordinance. So maybe something for the uh, planning commission to consider to let the process um, and the applicant pursue that exception. I'm uh, leaving this up to the commission. I'm open for a motion if anybody's ready. I'll go ahead and, and make a motion. Unless Thank you, Adrian. there's more discussion. Um, okay. So based on the information and the staff report and the testimony provided at the public hearing, I move that the planning commission approve the condition requested conditional use application PLN PCM 2021-00540 subject to the following conditions. One, landscaping shall be provided in the park strip and a 10 foot front yard setback. And two, the existing fence shall be moved back at least 10 feet to accommodate the required front yard setback, landscaping and site distance triangle. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second. Was that John? 
Yes. Okay, thanks. All right, I have a motion from Adrian and a second from John. Let's take the vote. Carolyn? Agree. Andreas? Oh, yes. Sarah? Yes. Maureen? Yes. Adrian? Yes. And John? Yes. Okay, that um, is passes unanimously. Um, good luck with that, Ms. Leva. And thank we, you for your time. Thank you. And we are concluding with the uh, Planning Commission tonight, unless anybody has a comment. I will adjourn this meeting and we will see you all again August 11th. Good night, Good night. everyone. Good night. Everybody, thank you. Everybody. Thank you. Good job, Amy. Thank you.